Hi, it's Chris for Day Podcast. Three, two, one, let's go. Welcome to Don't Mind the Golden Handcuffs Podcast or DMGH Podcast. A place for future and present attorneys or any young professional to find the motivation they need to further their minds, careers, and financial success. It's hard to make it out there when you came from nothing. We want to provide you with some help with that. Of course, a one-person team couldn't accomplish this. DMGH Podcast experienced guests will guide us on this road to career and financial success. First, let's take this law thing one step at a time with your host, Chris. Let's get started. Today, we have with us Dan Barley, a professional real estate investor and also attorney. Dan, thank you for coming today. Thank you so much for having me, Chris. It's a real honor to be here today. My pleasure, as always. I have invested with Dan before, and I learned 99.99% of what I know in terms of real estate investing through him. (laughs) I definitely... I definitely owe everything I have with real estate to Dan. Uh, Thank and you, Chris. No, it's my pleasure. Uh, so let's get started. Dan, why don't you tell us a little bit about how you started off? Uh, maybe law school is a good place to start? Sure. So I actually uh, took a couple of years off before going to law school. I worked in mortgages and I did some, you know, I tried some business ventures. Um, nothing too successful, obviously. I ended up going to law school to try to make a difference and chase the elusive dream. And what was law school like for you? Uh, law school was, uh, a lot of work, of course, as you know, uh, tons of reading, a lot of work, um, and then just trying my hardest to be the best I could be, uh, to hopefully get land one of those big jobs, uh, making those big incomes that you only dream of and hear about. And how did you, what did you do after, after law school? So, uh, interesting. Um, I, a month after I graduated law school, I got diagnosed with leukemia again. So I had to get a bone marrow transplant and I put my life on hold for essentially two years while I was recovering. And uh, it was a true blessing in disguise because because of that, I ended up starting my own law firm once I was able to get better. Um, I leveraged my contacts that I had from doing mortgages. I started cold calling real estate offices to sell my services as a real estate attorney. And very quickly, I built up uh, my own law firm and haven't looked back since. And what's it like starting? What is it like starting your own law firm? Must be a lot of pressure. Oh yeah, lots of pressure. It's scary. Uh, it's, there's times it's still scary now, of course. Um, but thankfully, I had good people. You know, I surrounded myself with good people. I hired a good paralegal to help, and you know, I was able to grow and continue to you know hone on my skills while also serving my clients. Did that make going through leukemia a little bit easier being able to work from home because i assume you worked from home when you started your law firm when i started my law firm it was i was working out of my house Mm -hmm. uh but it was after i had recovered so it was once the doctors gave me the green light that i could return to the workforce which was about a year and a half after my transplant yeah then i was you know working from home and trying to build a business that way yeah and were you fully recovered like what's the recovery process like with leukemia um i i don't even know um mm-hmm. i had to get all my immunizations like a one-year-old uh so measles mumps mmr chicken pox all that stuff and once the once all my counts were stabilized i guess for some times then the doctors said you can have essentially a good bill of health and you can go start working again but what was your mindset like to to recover i went through all of that and then suddenly start enter the workforce and having the pressure of starting a law firm. Like, what was your mindset even like after recovery? Um, I figured I, I kind of got a forced time off from work. Um, I've never been one to not want to work or not have a very strong work ethic. So it was tough to have to just succumb. I kind of just had to take that pressure off myself. Big look, this is what I have to do. I have to focus on my recovery and get better so I can return to work. Once I got the green light, um, I was scared. Of course, because, you know, here I'm starting my own law firm out Mm -hmm. of, you know, a year and a half battle of leukemia. And I was like, what's going to separate me from every other attorney out there? And I knew, A, one, it was going to be my personality, two, how I treat people, which is always with respect, and three, my work ethic. And I knew my work ethic was going to show quickly, and it did. And that's how I was able to very quickly have, uh, you know, a real office, a, a full paralegal and build my law firm. How long did it take for your office to stabilize? Uh, three months. Three months? That's yeah. pretty quick. It was very fast. It, it all happened very quickly. And you know, wow. I met the right people, but again, by hustling, by yeah. working my tail off to make sure I was out there and getting my name out there and yeah. 
doing the good work to follow it up. That's actually really impressive. I think I've never heard, I think Pratik is here with us on the side. You can't see him, but I think we've heard that you shouldn't expect to make a profit for like a year at least. Yep, that's for sure. Yeah, it's usually, I think they say a year to year and a half before yeah. you make a profit, yeah. So you, you were kind of, you were obviously ecstatic when you started making profits? I was, uh, again, taking scary steps of, you know, taking on a salary, yeah. taking on a, an office expense and so on. But I knew if I wanted to build a law firm, that was the way to do it. What year was that? Excuse me, 2011. Oh, okay, so, so that was, was soon, that wasn't too long after it was like the worst territory for attorneys, right? 07, 08? Yeah, 08 is when the market crashed significantly and there was a lot of fallout. And then uh, as the market crashed, my health crashed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then I recovered and I was able to start. So I started my law firm during the recession, during when things were bad. So, I mean, to, to me, it actually worked out good because I didn't have anything to compare it to. That's true. But I would hear all these attorneys talk about how good things were in 2005, 6, 7. And, but then they had massive changes in their life when the market crashed and they had to fire three quarters of their staff and they, you know, were taking home significantly less. And I didn't know any of that. All I knew was, uh, I started when it was quote unquote bad and I just built it as best as I could. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So it, you said it took three months to stabilize. Did you, like, what was the, I guess, lowest point in terms of, was there a point where you were like, maybe I made the wrong choice. I sh maybe should have went to a law firm every day. Every day. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what kind of triggers that type um, of, well, because as a lawyer, as you know, and Pratik knows, we deal with people's stresses. So no one's going to call us to be like, hey, it's my birthday. I want to hug. It's, you know, hey, this person breached their contract with me. This person, I have to sue them for this. Or, you yeah. know, I got into transactional real estate thinking it was going to be, you know, it, everyone works towards a happy goal at the end. But mm -hmm. it's such an emotional process for people that uh, and of course, they take out the frustration on me, on the lender, on the title company. So a lot of stress. So kind of like a therapist in a sense. Yeah, feel, it feels like it. I, yeah, I think uh, I should get paid like a therapist. <laughs> <laughs> and what area of law do you do you cover? Uh, right now we do mostly real estate transactional work. We do some litigation and some matrimonial work as well. And what's the firm called? Uh, Barley and Associates. Great. And so you are a professional real estate investor, right? I am, thankfully. <laughs> so what about the law kind of pushed you towards I need to be financially free? That's a very good question. Um, I, I saw attorneys who were significantly older than I was uh, that were still doing all the same things that I was doing when I'm starting my firm to hustle to get business, running around at the age of 64 to try to solicit business the same way I was at the age of 30 trying to solicit business. And I looked at it and it wasn't just one, it was many attorneys. And I was like, is this my future? Is this what I want to do for the next 30 years of my life? And of course, uh, when I started my firm, I was working seven days a week. I was, you know, around the clock. You know, everyone was calling my cell phone at all hours. And then I ended up getting married and having my daughter, who's my wife for everything. And I realized that I don't want that lifestyle for myself. I wanted to be, uh, obviously, I need to support my family, but I want to make sure I have the time to be there for my wife and daughter. I don't want to be the absentee father who's always working or the laws are very, as you know, a very demanding profession. And I didn't want that to consume my life and who I became. So I guess that leads us to the next question where what what is or was, if it's the same, what is financial freedom to you? Because I feel like that term is always thrown around no matter what investing tool people use. So Absolutely. what is that So that, that's true. I've, I've heard it countless times. I've seen it countless times, read it countless times. To me, financial freedom is the ability to have enough passive income coming in to cover all of your expenses and maintain your lifestyle without having to work, actively work. Um, and then your life's not hampered by that. So that gives you the complete time freedom to do what you want. So if you don't work, all your expenses are covered and you can still live the quality of life that you want to live. And so I just Googled very common questions people get in terms of investing. So I yep. guess I'll shoot one at you right now. Yep. Let's go. What's your risk tolerance? And it's, did that help you choose what path you take? And I asked that because you seem like you don't mind risk. You started your own law firm. You hustled to get business when most people would be terrified of that. So what's your risk tolerance and That's did it affect your investment tool? Very interesting question. Um, so it's funny because I talk to some people and I ask, you know, when I when we get into the topic of investing and stuff like that. And like when I say like, oh, have you ever thought of investing in a property? And their response to me is like, oh, my God, I can't imagine having a second mortgage payment. And I'm like, wow, that's such a different mindset than what I have, where I'm like, I have m many, many more than two mortgage payments. And I can't like, that's the only way you can really grow and scale into a business is to have 
leverage. So you use other people's money, notably the bank's money. But it's not a commonplace. It's not taught in schools. So it's, yeah. again, for people when they hear something new and it's different, they immediately get scared and panicked. And I think fear is a lot of what holds people back from implementing anything. Yeah. And I think that's really natural. I think that a lot of people want to avoid risk because they have so many responsibilities. It's a path of least resistance. Right. I agree. Yeah, but I think that that gets in the way of people, I guess, advancing in their life and their dreams. Yeah, I think it really stops people from achieving success. There's a good expression, the devil you know is sometimes better than the devil you don't know. Yeah, I definitely see that so, being true. Yeah. So in terms of the question that we were tackling, so would you say you're high, you have a high risk tolerance or a low risk tolerance? Oh, uh, so I guess when I started out, I tried to minimize my risk. I still try to... Uh, I, I don't avoid risk, let's just put it that way, but I'm also smarter with my decisions on the types of properties I buy. Um, I learned through my experiences and through my journey about um, you know, narrowing my criteria and being much more specific and buying exactly what fits my criteria instead of just what might look good on a piece of paper. So I guess that leads us to the next question. How did you start investing? So that's a good question. Um, I studied for probably, I would say, two years, uh, reading books, networking, I also get to come at it from a different perspective because as an attorney doing a lot of transactional work, I had a lot of clients that I was doing their closings for that they they decided to, I want to enter real estate investing and I'm going to be a landlord. And I would see their steps and their missteps. And as I was doing more than one closing for them, I would, you know, pick their brain and I would ask them to, you know, like for their advice and like, how did they find their journey? So I really got hands-on live in the flesh experiences shared with me that I was able to draw on. So what type of books did you read? Was it only books or did you go to events or did you use mentors? What was your process? A uh, combination of all of those. Um, I definitely read a lot. I read a lot of books um, for a couple of years. I still continue to read pretty regularly. Uh, not at the same clip I did when I first started, um, but I read a lot of books. I went to a lot of networking meetings, a lot of events. Um, I, I tried to interview people, or interview people, but talk to people who were in the business and pick their brains as to what they knew, what they didn't know, what they liked, what they didn't like and get advice. And what are these books like? So as you know, I was able to invest in real estate with money that I gained from stocks. And with stocks, with books on stocks, it's they're very complex. You can't just pick mm -hmm. it up at Barnes & Noble and just start reading. So what are books like when it comes to real estate? Um, well, I think it's more than just real estate. I think a lot of it is mindset um, and learning A, the lingo, B, the concepts before you get into the specifics of what is ROI or cash flow or you know leverage and you know stuff like that. Um, but I think um, real estate is, is because it's a tangible asset that everyone has familiarity with. Everyone needs a roof over their head and everyone understands that. So I think it's an easier concept to grasp than stocks, which, as you said, uh, for a lot of people, if it's intimidating, they just yeah. turn off their mind and don't even want to go yeah. there. I feel like once people see numbers, they start kind of mm -hmm. not really attracted to looking at formulas and stuff like that. Right. Right. So talk a little bit more in terms of uh, when you started. Sure. So I realized, um, as I talked about, I did not want to be doing this for the next 30 years of my life and I needed to figure out another way to... What's this again? Practicing? Practicing okay. law and, and running around like the 60-year-old attorneys seeing what they're doing the same stuff I'm doing at the age of 30. Um, I wanted to be there for my family. I wanted to uh, free up my time and I realized that I'm going to do that through real estate. 90% of millionaires in the country, if not more, have done it through real estate. So I wasn't looking to reinvent the wheel. I was looking to create my own wheel essentially and that's kind of one thing we spoke about a different day where i feel like a lot of people hear about real estate and rental properties mm -hmm. and they get intimidated they think it's like a some sort of scam like bitcoin or something but real estate being a landlord is one of the one of the oldest professions i mean if not the oldest ever since there was a place to live there was a landlord essentially correct so it's not like anyone like you said no one we're not reinventing the wheel it's not bitcoin or cryptocurrency where it's all brand new these are stuff right. that that it it's not new at all, but it's new to you when you start out and you, you never saw it before. Right. It's time. It's proven over time. It's uh, it's a pattern of success that millions of people have followed before me. Yeah. So it's just, you know, who wants to follow it? Essentially, yeah. you have a choice to make. Yeah. And if you choose to go that route, it, you know, there are a lot of possibilities. It's not new to millionaires. It is not new to millionaires. <laughs> no, that's probably how they got to be millionaires yeah. is through real estate. Yeah. So as you were saying... Uh, where, where, where was I saying? You were saying how you wanted to kind of get out of the rat race. Oh yeah, right. So I wanted to get out, and so I I paid for uh, a coach and a mentor um, who was able to further hold me accountable and guide me in my process. Um, and through him, I also got introduced to some other people that I, again, would have never probably met otherwise. 
And, you know, those conversations led me to other people and so on and so forth until I identified the strategy that I wanted to pursue to build my portfolio of properties and accumulate my wealth on my journey towards financial freedom. What type of things did you get in terms of having that mentor? There was the positives. Also, what were the negatives? Sure. Uh, the negatives and the positives. The positives were I had someone who had done it that I could draw on their experiences. So if I have a question, I can call an email text and they would get back to me and you know give me advice based on someone who's actually done it. Whereas you hear all these guru seminars such as uh, like a Tony Robbins or a Rich Dad Company. Like... I remember calling you around midnight because I was thinking of <laughs> questions regarding a deal we were doing. That's right. And I couldn't rationalize it in my head. Cause like I said, these concepts, you don't just, if you don't have experience in it, you're not going to suddenly come up with a question and an answer, right? Correct. Like you need someone to go to with questions. Right. And Google is like the worst thing to do because oh, yeah. you have conflicting opinions. Like if you get if you get 12 investors in one room, all 12 will have different opinions regarding different investing styles. Right, right. But I remember calling you up. And, I remember that. Yeah. And I remember it was late. And yeah. uh, But you had that benefit because you had me, right? It was the yeah. personal connection, the relationship that you knew you could call me anytime. You could text me anytime. And I'm going to get back to you because we're partners. And I want to make sure you're, you're comfortable and understand the process. Yeah. So that's what I had with my coach. And I had several coaches over the years. And thankfully, it, you know, I've leveraged and implemented what they taught me. And I've been able to, you know... Uh, create my path towards financial freedom yeah so where are you right now uh right now as Besides far in the as, studio. as in the <laughs> studio with you on dmgh podcast the number one <laughs> podcast in the history of the world you heard it here first um, folks um i'm i'm close I'm, I'm getting towards my financial freedom number um i continue to work at it every day or you know most days how many properties do you have right now if you don't mind me um, i i don't mind it's been very surreal um i've been now buying for this will be my sixth year and i now have 92 properties already yeah which i when i started out i did not think was in the realm of possibilities me and my wife thought you know hey if we get like two a year and we do that for 10 years maybe then we get 20 and that yeah. was that was exciting but through again through my coaches through what I've learned and what I've been able to implement, I've been able to scale much faster than I initially anticipated. Um, so 92, uh, continue to build on that, continue to keep growing. And um, Do you feel like you were able to grow that fast because you had a mentor? Do you think having a mentor accelerates that process? Oh, without question. I think if you don't have a mentor, like we were talking about those seminars, like the Tony Robbins stuff, yeah. they you can get a lot of motivation and you can get a lot of excitement. And when you go and try to implement it and you have nobody there to ask, or nobody to hold your hand through it, what happens again? You get scared. You might go on Google, read something discouraging, yeah. and then you like yeah. turn the other way and move on. Yeah. Just I, speaking of that, I remember we went to a seminar. It was a, I think it was Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Amazing books, amazing yeah. people. One of my favorites. Um, I remember that day we were talking to people and networking there, and there were people that this was their third or fourth time going to introductory type Correct. of event. So yeah, it's great that you're going, but then part of me thought about like, you're probably there because you're not executing, right? Right. Or at least a certain portion of it, right? Right. Because I'm sure people go for networking opportunities and stuff like that. Yeah, I agree. But definitely ex execution is the most important. Yeah, action is the thing that will separate, you know, the winners from the losers, for lack of a better word, right? You can learn all the concepts till you're blue in the face, but if you never pull the trigger, if you never actually execute any of those, it's it's worthless. Yeah. And having a mentor definitely helps with that. Absolutely. I would, uh, without question, say that that's a huge difference for people. You look at you look at the greatest, even like the greatest athletes in the world. Tom Brady just unfortunately won his sixth Super Bowl. Um, a Giants fan, so it's unfortunate. And um, he has a coach. Michael Jordan, the greatest basketball player of all yeah. time, always had a coach. Yeah. And so having a coach makes a huge difference. Yeah, I, I watched um, the Joe Rogan podcast episode with the mm -hmm. Mike Tyson, and like a large portion of the podcast was just Mike Tyson talking about his coach, yeah. his, his trainer or something trainer, like that, right. whoever it is. But his right. trainer was like well known around the industry. Yeah, and that makes sense, it's right? You got to be trained. So important. You got to be trained, and you got to have someone that can be there to help push you to the next level. Yeah, you can't you can't get better by hanging out with the same exact people that got yeah. you to where you are. And like you said, it, I think it's mindset too, because the thing about mindset is that you need to learn how to think about money. You know, correct. Like a lot of people, they'll lose money the first month in any investment tool. They'll like lose money, for instance, and then they're done. They're not going to invest anymore, mm -hmm. yeah. as if there's no risk to investing. Right. You know? It's so silly. Mindset's so important. Absolutely, and that's part, you know part of what I I do now, paying it forward of teaching and yeah. teaching people these concepts, so they can implement it in their life to move towards financial freedom yeah. and understanding that there will be setbacks, there will be challenges. You have to work through them and expect them instead of. Just, yeah. hey, I'm throwing my hands up, but this is a scam. It doesn't work. 
and seeing it as opportunity. I remember yep. I've had so many conversations regarding anything, like let, let's say stocks or bonds or even real estate. And people will ask me, but what happens when the market goes down? Like what if the real estate market collapses or what if the stock market collapses? And I'm like, that's a perfect time to buy. That's not the time where you leave. Correct. So a lot of people see, oh, the market crashes. And that's, that's when like they the sell. worst thing in their, in their With, mind. Right, because yeah, it becomes yeah. an emotional process for yeah. them. And when, it's so funny because when Best Buy or Macy's has a sale, everyone goes running to try to pick up these consumer goods. But yeah. the stock market has a sale, which is a crash. Everyone yeah. runs and sells off their exactly. stocks, which is so stupid. Yeah. But I think it's common. People will look at like numbers. Let's say you like you're working with numbers less than 100, and they're like, "That makes sense." But once you see that, like larger numbers, it intimidates mm -hmm. them. Correct. It's the same exact thing. Yep. You're just dealing with larger numbers. Yeah. Just and, a few zeros after it, yeah. or yeah, and yeah. it changes everything for them. Exactly. I remember. I forgot what department store went out of business but um as soon as i learned that it was like it went out of business i rushed there and bought as many things as i can that i know i was going to use it's the right. same thing when you're talking about investing right like if the market collapses, you don't go there to return the stuff you bought yeah. you literally you try go to, to buy, buy more, more things because yeah, you know it's going to be a deal of course and i think I, I think i bought my google home during that time there you go that's actually a really good investment <laughs> <laughs> although now i know google listens to everything i say everything they're listening to us right now oh yeah oh man but yeah, so, all right, so that leads to, does that lead to the FFU? Yes, uh, so uh, Financial Freedom University. Thank you for the shirt, by the You're way. You're welcome. You're welcome. Nice <laughs> shirt. Uh, Financial Freedom University is a company that I created to work one-on-one -on -one with students who want to achieve financial freedom, who want to move to a better place in their life financially. And like you said, you got to learn the concepts. It's such a different way of thinking about money and life and everything we've been taught, essentially, in school. Uh, and you... And I, in critique, sitting over there, we've all gone through the formal educational system. And we weren't taught anything about money, investing, credit, all the stuff that really could help you towards that. So it's really kind of reshaping some of the beliefs and uh, mindsets that we have around money and about how to achieve wealth and what you're actually doing. And then we develop a customized plan to work one-on-one -on -one with students to help identify where they need to get to and then implement an exact plan for how to get them there. Yeah. Yep. I think it's, it's pretty... It's so amazing you're doing that for for one reason. When I was in high school, looking back, I'm, I'm shocked now that they don't teach us how to do taxes. They don't teach us about real estate right. or just investing in general, even if they had like an intro to investing or the right mindset to have for investing. Mm. But then I think about, okay, all right, maybe high school is too soon. But then college, how is yeah, it not required that. class? Right. And then I'm like, okay, okay, law school they're gonna have it. I mean, come on, medical school and law school. That's one of the top ways to get educated. Nothing. 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 Nothing at all. Makes so, you wonder. Yeah. That's probably another episode for another yeah, topic yeah, for yeah. another day is the educational system. Yeah. yeah. So if you have to give someone advice right now that's listening that wants to get into real estate or let's say investing in general, but let's actually just stay to real estate. What's the one piece of advice you would give them? Um, if I could give someone advice who's looking to just start out, I would say to get educated and get a mentor. Mm -hmm. And obviously, I would love to be that for them if they want to do that. Um, I'm sure you can link up our show in your show notes yeah. uh, to my to our website. Um, it's financialfreedomuniversities.com, plural. Um, and you'll see uh, my name is on there. So make sure my name is on there and you'll know you're in the right place. So what is the best thing about real estate? The best thing about real estate investing is the time freedom that it gives you. If you build it the right way, that we teach people how to build it and the way that I was taught to build it, it allows you to have more of your time back in your life, which is really all we, most of us want anyway. Um, so it allows you to know you can have a consistent, predictable income coming in, um, regardless of if you stay in bed for a week or if you have a medical emergency or you work as hard as you can. Do you mind if I throw some questions at, at you that are common? Sure. All right. Absolutely. So... Do I need a real estate license as a real estate investor? Uh, no, you do not. A real estate license is for someone who wants to buy or sell properties as an agent, usually for a brokerage. How do I start finding leads for my first deal? That's a good question, and it depends on a lot of different factors. So yeah. again, what a deal is for me is not a deal for you, is not a deal for Pratik. Everyone's got different parameters and criteria. So the student, if this is a student's question, is first we have to determine what kind of strategies you want to pursue before you get a deal like do you want a deal to do a rehab or do you want a deal to do a wholesale like there's just so many different ways to answer that question this one i like so where is it here which is the best exit strategy for my real estate goals 
dying and leaving it to your kids tax free. <laughs> <laughs> And why is that? Seriously, why is uh, why well, because uh, the, the way real estate works, when you if you pass, when you pass, um, there's a way to transfer the properties to your children or your beneficiaries tax free, um, so they'll never pay taxes, and then you've really set your children up for success in their life, mm. um, which I fully intend to do with my daughter. Mm. Yeah. Worst part about real estate? The worst part about real estate is uh, dealing with tenants. Mm. Um, I don't deal with tenants. I don't encourage any of my students to deal with tenants. Let me give you like 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 a situation that I think people assume, right? All right. So someone call you ready? Ready? I'm gonna call. I'm gonna call Dan. He's my landlord. I dial it. Dial it. And then you hear the ring. Hello. Hi. My toilet's broken. Now it is 1 a.m. right now, and I can't go to the bathroom. You need to solve this problem. I'm sorry, you have the wrong number. <laughs> <laughs> that's that, what most people think, that's right? What, that's what everyone thinks, is is thinks that being a landlord is fixing toilets at late hours or taking emergency calls. Yeah. But the way that I have it and the way that I teach all my students to do it is you have professional property management companies that are handling the management of the properties. I do, not, I do nev- never talk to my tenants. I don't even know what my tenants' names are all the time, unless I look. But I, I don't have that communication, so it also yeah. serves as a buffer between the tenant and myself. So there's someone in the middle taking care of all those phone calls, a professional company that addresses it properly yeah. and they get trained, the tenants get trained the right way. And that's funny too, because I remember I had a friend ask me, oh, what street is uh, are most of your houses on? And I honestly didn't remember. And they were like, right. how do you buy a property? And you don't even know, you forgot what street it's on. Right. It's, it's about the numbers. It's right? about the numbers, right? The, the property is not relevant. I, when I say that, obviously the address might not be the most relevant. Yeah. You want to buy on a good, uh, you know, what qualifies for your criteria. Once you have your criteria, whether it's one, two, three Main Street or four, five, six uh, Q Street, as long as they're in the right neighborhood on the right street, then you know that's not the most important thing as yeah. to the specific address of the yeah. property. Like I don't even have a mental snapshot picture of the houses in my head. You know, right. like I just think they all kind of blur together. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. And if you scale right, and if you scale your business and you're trying to build it the right way, that's the goal, right? Is you don't want yeah. to just be like, I have one house, that's it. I know exactly what it looks like. I know exactly how to walk around it with my eyes closed because that's not going to be a true business for anybody. Can I ask you one more question? Of course. So this might be one for a longer episode, um, but what are, what are the best tax benefits associated with real estate investing? That is a very deep question or can be a deep question. I'm, you know, I'm happy to come back anytime you want and your listeners want. Hopefully they're getting good value from this. Um, taxes, uh, taxes are the most, I'm sorry, real estate is the most tax friendly vehicle um, for investing. There's depreciation, there's write-offs, there's uh, cost segregation now is a big thing. Um, you know, like you can actually operate a fully profitable business and it'll show a paper loss on your taxes. So the uh, treatment that real estate gets from a tax perspective is second to none. Mm-hmm. What's the market market now? Is how would you describe the market now in terms of real estate investing? Um, it's very competitive. Um, it's you know loans are getting easier for a lot of people to get. So I think you have a lot of novices coming into the market and overpaying for properties, which for someone like you and me, if that creates a new comp, then we have more equity. But uh, for some, you know, for people overpaying, and again, if they're not doing it the right way, I think it creates for a lot of potential errors. Mm-hmm. And if again, if they're not, you know, doing it the right way, they risk, they have a big risk of, you know, going under essentially. Yeah. Um, if you know, if they over leverage themselves or they don't know how to operate a property properly, and that's part of what I said about the experience that I come from of being a lawyer and seeing my clients who would buy a property in New Jersey and want to be a landlord, and they would buy one house for four hundred thousand. Rented for three grand a month, and as soon as the tenant missed the payment, they could no longer afford the property, and they were seeing me for other reasons, like, hey, "Do I need to file bankruptcy? Am I going to get foreclosed on?" And it was, yeah. you know, what started out as a happy experience turned quickly for them yeah. to one of despair. People so, might be saying, "I live in New York City, California, New Jersey. Think like property here is way too expensive. Should that be the like door shut?" Like, absolutely not. That's uh, a great question. There's a, a great uh real estate guys podcast it's a great group of guys uh they've been doing it for 30 years their podcast is one that i listen to religiously i love their material they they have a great expression that says live where you want to live invest where the numbers make sense so my properties as you know are not being bought in new jersey new york city california they're being bought in other parts of the country um 
where the numbers make sense and where the laws are more favorable to us as the owners of the property instead of here. All right. Awesome. Dan, thank you for coming today. Oh, thank you, Chris. It's been such a pleasure. I hope uh, I provided good value and I hope yeah. we get to do this again soon. And I expect you to come back because there's a list here of a lot of questions I know people. Would I would love to. And I, you know, for your listeners, again, if they want to contact me, I'm happy to answer their questions and I'll be ha- here anytime you'd have me. Awesome. If people need to reach you, like you said, Financial Freedom Universities. Yes, Financial Freedom Universities.com, plural. Um, or they can email me directly at my personal email, which is barleydan at gmail.com. That's B as in boy, A-R-L-I-D-A-N at gmail.com. So my last name, first name at gmail.com. All right. Awesome. Guys, if you like this, subscribe if you're watching on YouTube, like, leave a comment, ask, ask me some questions in the comment section, email me. If you're watching this on Google Play Podcast or iTunes Podcast, subscribe, leave a review. Um, and just show us you're listening and that you like what's happening. Awesome. Thank you as always. Until next time, it's Chris from DMGH Podcast. Talk to you guys later.